Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the second installment in the 2020 series, Insight Series Bowtie Chats. My name is Michael Clement, and I'm really excited to walk you through this presentation tonight. We're gonna to be moving at pretty much breakneck speed, so hold on to your hats. Thank you all for who are attending. We've got folks from all across the great state of Michigan and even one Buckeye with us. I'm not gonna say anything, welcome aboard. So here's a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. I wanna introduce our team. First, you see Gary Cade down there at the bottom. Gary is our sustainability building consultant. He's gonna be joining us later. You see Kimberly Hainer, who's our Director of Communications. And in a second here, you'll see Austin Harrell, who's one of our enhanced interns. And there's Chloe Ferrari over there, who is our event manager. So we are all here to serve you. Here's a little bit of background, and they're uh, gonna be joining us later in the breakout rooms. This is the second of a four event series that we're calling the Bowtie Chats. Event one, Creating Your Green Home has already occurred, that's uh, viewable on our YouTube channel. We are now starting the first of the two-part series of creating your beautiful home. Coming up next, we'll be creating your not-too-big home. And then last, creating your energy-free home. So we're trying to bring you guys the best of what we have to share. First 20 minutes, sharing of insights. Second 20 minutes, breakout rooms. And open forum discussion, so bring anything you want to ramble about to that and we'll spend as much time as you'd like, at least 20 minutes that is. And then all attendees will be muted until the breakout room. So hold on to your thoughts, ideas, and questions and we'll connect with you at the end. All right, let's get started. So we're here to learn about how to create your beautiful home. However, this is not gonna be about <laughs> paint color and shadow lines. This is about going deep. This is not a skin deep conversation. And we're going to be sharing with you three fundamental rules that we have used over the years to create beautiful homes. As I always say, all of the really big mistakes are made with the first few decisions. And our goal tonight is to give you in 20 minutes a succinct overview of these key three rules. This week, we're talking about the big three, the rules, the goals, the budget. In two weeks, we will have the second in the installation series of Creating Your Beautiful Home, and we will be covering the even bigger three, space, adjacency, and circulation. But well, let's tackle the first three right now tonight. Architectural design, I hate to tell you, is really nothing more than solving problems in physical space. It's about connecting the dots. But first, you, you have to really understand and know those dots. And this rule of three applies across the board. We're starting off with the rules. So before we do anything, we wanna understand the rules of the game. The rules of the game in residential design begin with this wonderful tome, my Bible, called the Michigan Residential Code. And in that, it's gonna to prescribe to us height and story regulations, fire separation distances, things that are relevant to the home itself. The second big book of rules is something called the ordinances, the municipal ordinance. And that's another Bible. That's my Bible part two, Old Testament, New Testament. And these codes of ordinances help us understand zoning classification, area, height placement, information and regulations on principal and accessory structures. And then, but wait, there's more. We're also looking at environmental regulations. And environmental regulations are growing to be even more and more important as we're seeing more and more impact on the natural environment. So one of the key things that we help clients determine before they're doing anything, before we even worry about building footprint, is understanding the environmental impact of their possible site, floodplain and wetland regulations. This is, I can't tell you, well I can tell you, an unfortunate story, a gentleman bought a piece of land, got excited about it. He was gonna make it into his dream home, bought himself a front loader, went out, started moving dirt around. The DEQ, now it's the EGLE, got wind of it and said, hello, Mr. Sir, we're uh, excited to tell you that we will not be charging you the thousands, tens of thousands of dollars of impact fine for uh, creating a, a new ecosystem, but we will allow you to restore the ecosystem and that's gonna take about five years. 
So we want to make sure we avoid that before we get too far down the road. Another thing which is often overlooked is what we call deed restrictions. And this is something that's teased out through doing title work. And what we're finding is that there are regulations that run with the property that are independent of building code, municipal, and environmental regulations. And we have discovered all kinds of things. Uh, the most embarrassing thing, I think, is when one of our clients discovered that he had been mowing 12 feet of his neighbor's property for the last 10 years. So making sure you understand what is actually yours to improve on and any special encumbrances or land use rights, you'd be surprised at what we discover. And many times, this is not discovered for those who don't know to look for it until well down the path. And it doesn't matter how pretty those gables are or how nice the windows are if you have to completely redesign your house. And then there's covenants, codes, and restrictions. And these are the regulations that are placed on you with the local homeowners association. This is only enforced by the local homeowners association if that actually exists. So if there's no homeowners association, these might exist on the books, but they're not enforced by the local government. They are only a, a kind of a regional enforcement. This all has to be layered because the most restrictive is what governs. And so it's our job to help you and your job to understand what these layers and parts and pieces are before you take step one in terms of designing your new home. Now we're moving to the second of the rule of three, of the big three. And this is the goals. This is where we have the conversation, in the words of Simon Sinek, start with why. I always say that people don't get what they want because they don't know what they want. A big piece of our job at Architectural Resource is helping people discover what they truly want. And when we do that, we generate something called a project goals document. Uh, for those in the know, it's called a, a programmatic guide. But that doesn't mean anything to people who don't have a master's degree in architecture. So we call it a project goals document. And this spells out in words and numbers exactly what we're up to with our clients' projects. The project goals document becomes our guidepost for design and our yardstick for success. What this document does is it induces clarity on all parties. And by, by that, what I mean, you might be surprised, but it hasn't happened once, maybe more than once, where we meet with clients and her ideas and his ideas are maybe not in the same environment or maybe not even on the same planet. So this brings this all together into a cohesive, unified goal. Then we take a look at the client needs. These are the specific must have. What we ask folks to do, which takes some effort, is to go through this list and prioritize. And we ask them to generate separate lists. This allows them to have their expression because that's part of our job. So here's an example that we would find on a typical project. We would get together and we'd sit down with our clients and he would bring us his list and then she would bring us her list. Uh, the discrepancy in number of items is, is not uh, inconsequential. And if you notice, she scribbled a few things in the margin on the car ride over to our office. But that's part of our opportunity is to wrap all of this stuff together. Then we start the very important conversation of distinguishing needs from wants. Because that's where the choices come that are really going to be driving the budget. This is, we call this process discovery. And I'm gonna share a story with you, which is a true story. And that is, I sat down with a couple and they said, Michael, we want a sunroom. And I said, great, let's do our discovery process and let's learn together what you're looking for in terms of your sunroom. And so we went through the steps of the process and what they discovered and we discovered with them is they didn't want a sunroom. What they wanted was sun in their rooms. And so we went on a completely different trajectory. We didn't add one square inch of sunroom and we completely transformed their house, adding skylights and clear story windows and transfer windows. 
we brought the sun into the spaces that they had. This is not at all unusual where we have clients who come in thinking they want A, and through our discovery process, they actually learn they want B. We have found that to get the good answers, you have to ask the good questions. And that's exactly what the discovery process is all about. And then we move into the other of the big three, which is the, the 600 pound gorilla in the room, and that's the budget. And we waste absolutely no time in going right to the conversation of the budget. It, it still amazes me to this day, and I've got builder colleagues who, who come and tell me stories where they have got folks showing up at the builder's office, rolling out a set of plans, and they want to build their dream home. And my builder colleagues ask the couple, has anyone discussed construction costs? And the answer is no. It's incredible. It's shocking, and this happens all the time. In our office, in the way that we work, the conversation about the budget happens right away. And what we usually find is there's the pile of cash, and then there's the pile of goals. <laughs> and they're typically not the same. In fact, it's never equal. And usually, the proportion that's off is usually about half. But that's okay because that gives us a place to start because design is all about compromise, finding a way to get what you want to fit inside of your budget, whatever that budget might be. And we always tell folks, don't let budget stop you from making the changes that you wanna see happen because there's always something we can do. And no matter what we do, it's gonna be better than what you're living with now. So I share this chart because it seems to edify what we're talking about here in terms of this needs and wants hierarchy. So on the left axis, you see project costs from minimum to max. And on the bottom axis, you see it moving from needs to wants. And that's what the project program goals help dissect. Somewhere we find that sweet spot where those two intersect, where we find a budget that makes sense and a balance between the needs and wants that makes sense. And that is part of our project process. That's exactly what we do. What we find too is it's important to establish expectations. And usually there's something that has to give, which is okay because you're in the meantime getting something back. And what we do is we usually generate not just one design solution, but we come with three. And we tier these in terms of good, better, and best. Good is gonna be looking at more the lowest possible cost. Best is gonna be looking at more the balance with the higher possible aspirations. And we work together to find this beautiful synergy between budget and goals. And it's all based on how you, as the client, will recognize success. Which, remember that project goals document? That becomes our barometer. The other thing we like to tell folks is always have a contingency. In the industry, there's this concept called scope. And I remember this wonderful cartoon. Well, actually it wasn't a cartoon, it was a picture. There was a huge yacht. And then attached to the back of the yacht was a little dinghy. And on the back of the dinghy, it said original contract. And on the back of the yacht, it said change order. So we always tell folks, good planning can help you avoid that, but always set aside at least 15% to allow for the unforeseen. This is gonna make a huge difference in terms of the goal of your project. Now, the usual conversation right out of the gate is, well, how much is this project gonna cost? And we look at cost per square foot. That's a great place to start, but it's kind of like buying a car by the pound. It's not a very accurate metric, but it's a place to start. We then look at cost per component. So what does that mean? Well, it's like, how many bushels of this and how many bushels of that? So it's like buying by the gross. Well, we got a bathroom, a master bedroom, a kitchen, and so we can look at component costs. But what we find is what really drives the cost of any project are two levers, quality and quantity. Those are the two levers that we have. And what's really exciting about this is that in our design process and how we work, you get an opportunity to manipulate those. 
and you can see real time in front of you how that plays out because of our unique integrated design process where we bring the builder and the clients and us all together at the onset to tie everything all together. We have a well-honed three-step process that helps our clients weave their way through the design process and come up with not only exciting and beautiful, but also affordable and cost-effective designs. And these three steps look like this. So the first step to creating a beautiful home is to put form to your whys. The whys that we've teased out in the project goals document. The second step is to take a look at all of those different options, put together pricing alternatives, and they determine what is our final strategic direction. And so we unify all of those different design schemes into one cohesive design solution. And then we move into the third step. Your beautiful home is gonna be created first on paper. It's built first on paper and then in the field. And that's very important because when we're working in the paper environment, well, actually it's a digital environment, but we call it paper. That's our opportunity to work out all of the issues and bugs and to give you a chance to virtually experience your home. So you will have a chance through the power of our advanced design software to don a set of 3D goggles, which will be basically your cell phone with a device that we give you, which you can take anywhere and walk through the house and spend time in the living room and stand in the kitchen and see your views outside the window. And this is all possible inside of our design software. And this is how you get to beauty. I'd like to have my colleague, Gary Cade, join us now and share a few thoughts from a builder's perspective on how this all plays out from the vantage point of a builder. Gary thought he was gonna retire from building, but I said, no, you're not. You've got way too much to give to this industry. Come and join us and help us hone our process and become even better. Gary. Gary, you're, you're muted, my friend. Sorry about that. So you thank go. you, Michael. And Thank you everyone for being here this evening. Uh, just a little background, I've been building close to 40 years and if you count the dog house I built when I was eight, it's closer to 60. <laughs> but something about us builders is we're very slow to innovate. Uh, we're really comfortable keeping things, doing things the way we've always done them. You know, such that I've coined a phrase of what we're building today or what I call BNOs. And what BNO stands for is we're building brand new and obsolete homes, which is really crazy when you think about it, brand new and obsolete. But uh, so, so what there is to say about all that is there is a better way. And it all starts, if there's one thing to take away from this evening, it all starts with planning. In fact, uh, mostly again, builders, we don't like planning much because we love what happens when there's poor planning. As Michael will continue here, one hour of planning before avoids 10 hours adjusting during and 100 hours of correction after. And those 100 hours can turn to lots of dollars. So if there's one thing to take away from tonight, it's really how critical planning is and you can never start too early. Uh, a lot of times people think, well, you know, I don't have my property, uh, this isn't in place, but actually the sooner you start, the more successful your project will be. And as a bonus for being on the call tonight, uh, Michael is offering an opportunity to actually have a chat with him one-on-one. -on -one. And really that is the beginning of understanding the process and what it all takes to have a successful project. So uh, at the end of our breakout sessions. If you'd like to do that, uh, we have Michael's calendar and we can schedule that for you. So thank you again. Thank you, Gary. And what you're saying makes so much sense. What we don't want you to do is come to us too late. You can never start planning too early, but you can start planning too late. So we want to thank you very much for being part of this rapid fire 2020 insight series. 
And in nine seconds here, actually in five seconds, we're going to move you into the open forums and you'll be automatically shunted. We'll see you in the forum.